The Bus in Crisis, page 251 of Tracy E. Kameyer's Civil Rights and the Gateway to the South. Published by University Press of Kentucky um, in 2009. The Busing Crisis. For two decades, the, quest the question of <clears throat> equal ed educational opportunity in the public schools had become a back burner issue in Louisville. The city prided itself on having resolved that problem when it integrated the schools to great national acclaim in 1956. So. Uh, public perception, Louisville had integrated in 1956. Everybody was happy in Louisville. Um, yet in the mid-1970s, conflict over school desegregation sparked Louisville's worst race relations crisis of the post-war era. When in September 1975, court-ordered busing began bringing black and white students together on a large scale in the newly merged city and county system, white opponents of integration launched a school boycott and mass demonstrations, the latter devolving into vandalism and rioting that required the intervention of the National Guard earned the city condemnation from the national press. The local anti-busing movement, the largest, most organized, and most vocal opposition seen during the Civil Rights era in Louisville, revealed the extent of resistance to further change in the racial status quo, particularly among whites in the newly developed suburban subdivisions just outside the city. Moreover, the rhetoric of the anti-bussers linked them to the rising new right, like the Tea Party, Newt Gingrich, Grover Norquist, and the tide of anti-government conservatism that contributed to the hostile climate for progressive social activism. So Nader, Kucinich, McKinney, Jill Stein, uh, Rand Paul would also be the new right, Tea Party. The crisis created by the anti-busing movement, however, also produced an outburst of pro-integration anti-racist activity on the part of traditional civil rights leaders, African-American parents, and faith-based and secular human relations advocates. Some people and groups cared most about black access to good education and equal treatment in the schools. Many others focused on the interrelatedness of segregation in housing and schools. More important, the constituent parts of this coalition responded to what they saw as a rising and frightening level of open racism in the community. But just as the anti-busing movement revealed the limits of the acceptance of integration by large segments of the local population, the experience of these pro-integration activists over the next year raised questions about the efficacy of the traditional civil rights tactics of demonstrations, boycotts, public persuasion, and politics. Thus, during the busing crisis, a wide variety of groups and individuals rallied in an increasingly hostile climate to try to overcome not only the opposition to school integration, but the persistent problem of racism, searching as they did so for a new combination of tactics that could be effective against an old enemy. In the decade and a half after Louisville received Folsom praise for the peaceful integration of its public schools, evidence mounted that the job was not done after all. Throughout the early 1960s, school officials reported steady progress in the number of black teachers on previously all-white faculties and the rising percentage of students who attended mixed schools. Observers noted, however, that often that mixture included only one or two students of the minority race. After the Civil Rights Act of 1964 threatened to cut federal funding for segregated schools, token integration in the continued existence of single-race schools drew increasing attention. In a study conducted in response to the law, the Kentucky Board of Education declared four schools in the city in danger of losing their support. Not long after, the AHRC criticized the limited integration of teachers and administrative and supervising personnel in the system. The most sweeping and damning indictment, however, came in the 1971 Kentucky Commission on Human Rights report, Louisville School System Retreats to Segregation, which concluded that over the preceding decade, the city schools had become racially isolated when at least 90% of the student body was of one race. And in fact, the polarization of the schools was worse than at any time since 1956. The report charged bluntly that the Louisville school system has failed, either by design or by lack of effort, to deliver on the promise of full student and faculty desegregation. In response to this growing body of evidence, the NAACP began to push local officials to integrate remaining single race facilities and to expand numbers beyond tokenism. After the Supreme Court ruled against freedom of choice plans in Green v. County School Board of New Kent County in 1968, African Americans threatened legal action if the city did not drop the transfer option. 
the local NAACP received guidance from the national organization which was devoting more energy to the school issue and to, in anticipation of the impending 10-year deadline for desegregation established by the Civil Rights Act in 1964. In 1969, the NAACP National Education Director urged the Louisville Group to call on the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, HEW, which it had been charged with enforcing the education component of the Civil Rights Act for help. Two months later, the NAACP filed a complaint with HEW accusing the city of using discriminatory zoning, pupil placement, and the transfer plan to reinforce racial isolation in the schools. While the complaint was being investigated, the superintendent of schools, Samuel No, retired and the, the system hired a young reformer named Newman Walker, formerly, formerly of Paducah, Kentucky. Walker agreed with NAACP and promised to work with it and Hugh HEW to improve integration into the system. Meanwhile, persistent segregation and a board of education that refused to do anything about it plagued the county school system. The percentage of students attending school with those of another race had always lagged behind that in the city system. Teacher integration, too, remained a problem in the early 1960s. In the county elementary schools, not a single white student was taught by a black instructor. Moreover, assignment policies and busing bolstered student segregation. After the Supreme Court's ruling in Swan v. Charlotte, the Mecklenburg Board of Education that busing children was a legitimate and constitutional means to erase the racial identification of schools, HEW ordered Jefferson County to desegregate the all-black Newburgh Elementary School by fall uh, 1971. The county school board drew up a number of plans to do so, each of which put the burden of Busting completely on black children, when HEW rejected all the proposals, the county school board voted to ignore the integration deadline at the risk of losing $4 million in federal funds and seemingly invited a lawsuit. Almost immediately, the KCLU obliged the board with a suit to force integration of the school. Having launched that suit, the KCLU turned its attention to the city system, and after some debate, over the appropriate remedy to seek in June 1972 joined the NAACP in suing for the desegregation of the Louisville schools through annexation of white students who lived in the contiguous suburbs. Almost immediately because its staff believed annexation and annexation would not be enough, the Kentucky Commission on Human Rights filed an intervention in the case asking the court to order the merger of local school districts instead. Judge James F. Gordon of the Western District of Kentucky quickly declared that he could not order either merger or annexation. And then after hearing arguments on the consolidated city and county suits, in March 1973, Gordon ruled that the systems were not segregated and that they were in compliance with constitutional requirements under previous school desegregation rulings. School officials were elated and relieved. Civil rights advocates, of course, had a different response. Disappointed but not deterred, they vowed to appeal the decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati. Six months later, a three-judge panel at the appeals court heard evidence that 83% of the city schools were racially identifiable. Their decision, announced on December 28, 1973, was almost diametrically opposed to Gordon's. They ruled that both the city and county violated previous court rulings because they failed to eliminate all vestiges of state and post segregation. Moreover, the court ordered Gordon to hold hearings on plans for desegregating the schools by the start of the new school year in September 1974. The options proposed at the time for doing so include merging the system, cross-district busing, and integrating each system separately. Thus, in the spring of 1974, with a notable lack of enthusiasm, the school boards of the city and county began to formulate plans for integration. 1974. As the school boards met to produce the plan, rumors of the extent of busing they were considering ignited the first mass white opposition. Over the next several years, myriad grassroots anti-busing organizations formed behind a number of outspoken leaders. Some were relatively large and enduring, including concerned parents under Susan Connor, which at one time claimed 16,000 members and citizens against busing behind William Kellerman. Others lasted for only one demonstration or were mentioned fleetingly in the press and then disappeared from view. The first major anti-busing organization was Save Our Community Schools, SOCS, led by Joyce Spond. Joyce Spond. So there's uh, Susan Connor and Joyce Spond. It began 
It began in 1971 as a small group of women in Shively who were concerned that busing might happen in Jefferson County. By that time, transportation of some students were commonplace, but the founders of SOCS were responding to the controversy over Newburgh Elementary School and the threat of busing being used for the purpose of integration. The organization incorporated in 1972 and eventually had a newsletter mailing list of 3,000 people. Spawn come from nearby Nelson County, and she and her husband, a business agent for Teamsters Local 89, owned farms in Hardin and Meade counties, though they lived in Jefferson County. Their children attended Butler High School, which, because of its racial balance, was not likely to be affected by busing, but that did not stop Spawn, Joyce Spawn, from getting involved in the issue. SOCS and Joyce Spawn herself would remain influential, the relatively moderate leaders of the anti-busing crusade through the mid-1970s. So Joyce Spawn and Susan Connor are uh, leaders of the anti-busing crusade in the mid-1970s. As the prospect of busing became more real, SOCS focused its, uh, its attention on a resolution inter introduced to the General Assembly by Representative Dottie Pretty that call for an anti-busing amendment. <laughs> so they offered an amendment to this constitution. Dottie Pretty um, wanted an anti-busing amendment. So no school buses. If that would have been passed, I wouldn't have been able to get to school. I was bused. I was in a rural area. So fuck you, Dottie Pretty. Um, Spawn claimed they had petitions with 20,000 signatures supporting the amendment. She added that some African Americans had signed, though that was not verified, and insisted that her organization was against busing, not against integration. A, re a refrain repeated by anti-busing organizations throughout the ensuing crisis. Within a two-week period, SOCS leaders and others sponsored a rally of 700 people on one occasion, 1,000 people on another, and led a group of 200 to Frankfurt to support Pretty's measure. The General Assembly rejected the proposed amendment but did not pass a resolution calling for the federal government to enact such an amendment. Meanwhile, anti-busing sentiment spread in the county among white students and their parents. In late February, white students boycotted class at Fairdale High School and walked out briefly from uh, Pleasure Ridge Park High School, Southern High School, and Lassiter Middle School to express their opposition to busing. And on the eve of the official announcement of the plan, Angry white parents took two hours to berate the county board for considering busing their children to city schools. Less dramatically and with less public attention during this period, an interracial coalition of individuals and civic groups began to organize support for busing and countywide desegregation. The lawsuits that culminated in the court order had originated from cooperation between civil rights groups, chiefly the NAACP and the predominantly white KCLU, thus grounding the issue in biracial cooperation. In 1972, the Ad Hoc Committee for School Integration formed to educate the public about the need for integration in general and busing in particular. Then, in early 1974, a number of other organizations endorsed the court order and hosted programs to smooth the way for its implementation. The list of these organizations overlapped strikingly with those who had worked for open housing, more of their goal, creating a positive community climate for integration, harking back to the efforts of community groups and school administrators in 1956. The HRC, for example, held meetings with white suburban organizations to help find ways to make busing work, and the local units of the National Council of Jewish Women and League of Women Voters once again sought, as they had with open housing beginning in 1963, to foster productive discussion by hosting public forums. Participants in this fledging pro-busing movement demonstrated their willingness to speak out against the growing local and national backlash against court-ordered integration. At a county board of education meeting shortly after the plan was announced, in contrast to rallies across the county denouncing the prospect of busing, in this case, a group of about 150 people turned out to congratulate the board. Sally Baker, speaking for Citizens for Affirmative Integration, argued that quality education required integration and promised to work with any other like-minded organization toward promoting acceptance of that plan. Tom Jones, a Jefferson County resident representing an unnamed, unorganized group, of what he claimed were hundreds of black and white concerned citizens spoke up calling the fears of his white neighbors about school integration hogwash. <laughs> the Eastern Area Council submitted a list of suggestions for how the school board might prepare teachers, students, and the community. So, the busing crisis in Louisville, Kentucky, 1975, riots. WASP were fucking pissed off because black people wanted to go 
to white schools.